Okay, so today's going to be the, uh, a quick review on whatever we've talked about down to this point. Then we're going to uh, go more in detail in arrays and, and structures and understand how, they, how to work with them. Uh, next day, when you're coming to class on the lab, that's a very important session. I'm going to teach pointers. Okay, and pointer is something that uh, affects the whole, the whole chain of C, C++ subjects till the end of your career. So if you get it nicely, you're going to be okay. So, and I'll, and I'll do my best to do that. So make sure you, you be in the lab. Okay, hopefully the projector is going to work, uh, <laughs> and we're going to do it. But uh, that's very important to be there, okay? So it is extremely important to be there. <sighs> Quickly going through everything that we've talked about, we said that um, individual arrays, the individual elements of in individual variables don't do much in programming for us because we need more memory to remember things in our program so we can deal with it later on. Now, <clears throat> uh, if I want to create many variables, I can start naming them, it's difficult. Instead of doing that, I can simply say I want an integer and create an array. So essentially with an array, I create a name, and after I create the name, I in front of the name in a square bracket, I say how many I want, and it's gonna give me that many integers, and we said that many integers, that many doubles, that many uh, whatever thing that we have, type that we have, you can create an array out of it. Now in here, I have uh, five integers, and we mentioned when you say five, uh, index starts from zero in C. Whatever size you see over there, the index is always one less. So if you hit that size, it means you're already out. Five is not a valid index for an array of five integers. Four is the latest one. We need to know that. We initialize the arrays using curly brackets. Actually, you will find out soon as you are going that curly brackets are becoming universal in initialization. So when you go to C++, you will see that it becomes the sign of initialization. Uh, you will see it soon when you come through it. But uh, you initialize an array uh, exactly like you write a set in math. You open curly bracket, you put the elements one by one, separate by comma, and the corresponding index, uh, index of the array will be set to that one. So in this case, index zero will be three, index one will be five, index two will be three, and goes on. You cannot initialize more than the number that you have. If you do that, you're gonna crash the, if the compiler is not smart enough to get you for what you have done, when you actually run your program, your program is probably going to crash because you go out of your own space. So you have five integers, you put seven values, which means you go outside of your memory. Not good. But if you have less than that, the rest will be nullified. The reason that I say nullify, I don't think that's actually a word. But when I say nullify, it means any type you have, everything over there will be set to zero. If it's double, it will be zero. If it's character, it will be zero. When I say zero, not the number zero, every single bit inside the, the variables will be set to zero, therefore it will be null, okay? Any type, literally, any type. So if what you have over there is smaller than size, the rest will be set to zero. Therefore, a good practice to set all the va elements of an array to zero is to set it to one zero and then the rest becomes zero, therefore everything's zero. So if I wanted that A5 to be completely all zero, all I need to do was this. And everything becomes zero, and it automatically, because the first one becomes zero, and the rest is not initialized, that becomes zero, and that's it. So that's the syntax of an array. And we said arrays are, <clears throat> we have to uh, realize that arrays are not single entity, so you are not creating a single variable. Whenever you create an array, it, it always happens like this. So whenever you create an array, an array has what we call a pointer, something that points, an address, okay? So that's the name of the array, and then that points to series of integers in memory, one, two, three, four, five, and this becomes a zero, 
A1, A2, A3, A4, and that's it, right? And that's how it works. That is why if you have another array, say integer B, five, and you have B, let's say, set to uh, some other five integers that you have, okay? If I have over here 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50, I cannot say B is set to A to set everything in an array because then you are setting these, these two things together. It has nothing to do with the array. The name of the array has nothing to do with the contents of the array. To actually get to the content, you have to add the index to it. So to properly set one array to another, you have to loop through it, which means if I want to, so this is wrong, and if I want to actually set these two arrays, I have to say four, I set to zero, I less than five, and I plus plus, and I have to say BI is set to AI. That's how you set everything in an array. An array is not a single entity. Only single entities can be set to each other, okay? Only single, a single variable created out of a type can be set to each other. If you have an array, you cannot make the whole array uh, uh, setting to another one. You have to do individual ones. Are we okay down to this point? This is just quick review on what we talked about down to this point. So, so we went through that and we understood what arrays are. And uh, we also pointed to the fact that when you are dealing with an array, we also pointed to the fact that when you are dealing with an array, because the array's name holds where the elements are, but not what they are, a uh, name of the array points to where the elements are, but not what they are. When you pass an array to a function, unlike a single variable, you can actually modify that array remotely within the function. So if I have, again, as I mentioned, something like A over here, and that A points to three elements, and they are all zeros, so this is an integer a3. If I have such a thing, then I want to set all these things to 50. If I want to do something like that, I can actually have a function. And I only pass the name over there. So I'm going to call this one array. And I put an empty curly bra uh, square bracket over there. Now in here, if I say four, obviously integer i, i set to zero, and i less than three, and i plus plus, I can actually set array i to 30. And what happens over here will be this. This is a, so if I walk through this, if I want to see how it's being walked through, I have, and let's say this is in my main, okay? And in my main, I have something like this. So main is essentially something like this. I have uh, int main. And in here, I have integer a3. And in here, I write set. A, if I do something like this, the walkthrough for this will look like this. So essentially, what you're going to have will be something like this. You're going to have this, and this is your main. And main has an array of three over there. So this is A, and that's going to be 0, A1, and A2. If you write it like this, you have three separate variables. That's not how it works. Really, in reality, in your walkthrough, you have one 
A over here that is like this. And this A of yours is actually pointing to three variables. So the A of yours over here is pointing to three variables that you have, like that. Okay? Then you come to your set function. In your set function, you have the array variable. Okay? And when main calls the set, it sets the A, which is the content of this one, into array. So this will be moved into array, and therefore, the array will point to the exact same place as the other one. So array and A are both pointing to the same place. Therefore, in the set, when it's being set to 30, it is going to point this one to 30, and 30, and 30, and therefore, the array in main changes. That's something that we can use because arrays names are Arrays names are pointers. They are addresses of where the data actually are being stored. When you pass an array to a function, you simply uh, can change it, as you see in read ints over here. So in read ints, I'm passing an array. And one by one, I'm getting the values of the integer and put it in the index of the array. OK? This A over there is wrong. I have to put over here array. So either I can do like that to you reuse my code in utils or do a scanf. Remember, every element of the array is an integer variable. So all rules apply. When you want to pass it to the scanf, you have to pass its address. Therefore, you have to put the ampersand in front of it. So address of array i will go over there. And as the loop goes through, address of array 0 will go there, address of array 1, address of array 2. And therefore, whatever integer array that is passed to this one, that is the one that is going to get set. So that was what we talked about arrays. And that's why arrays are a bit, little bit different. Then we talked about parallel arrays. And we said, when you are dealing with specific type of information for one single entity, which in our case is an item in a grocery store, we said, <clears throat> if I want to know what is the different features of, of the same entity, I can create several parallel arrays that each array holds one aspect of the entity. So we said if I have, uh, I would say, the maximum number of things that I can have inside a grocery store is 500. If that's the case, then I can have 500 SKUs, 500 prices, and 500 quantities. And then, as a parallel thing, I'll store all my values in here. So I will tell to myself, index 0 holds the SKU and price and quantity of the first item. Index 1 holds the SKU and price and quantity of the second item, and so on and so forth. These type of things are called parallel arrays. And because they are all kept in an array, I can simply pass the arrays to a function, and I call it read items. And one by one, I can get all the values that I want. Now, obviously, I put over here 500, but uh, I'm just putting over there 2 so we can see what it is, OK? We can uh, see how it works. So when you call actually read items, read items passes the SKU price and quantity addresses to the read items. Therefore, the read items, SKU price and quantity become the same arrays that are in the main. But as we ran this, I demonstrated to you that, uh, let me see. Uh, Again, this is a quick review of what we talked about last time. I'm going to just put it over here. So uh, uh, I was, no, parallel arrays. OK. So now in here, uh, um, I'm saying that read items will have access to the SKU. So read items will have 500 elements. But because I said only I want two of them, then it's just going to set the first two. 498 other items remained unused in our program. 
that's the price we have to pay, sadly, okay? We cannot, we, we have to know how much memory we want right from the beginning, maximum one, and then fill it with what the information we have and leave the rest, okay? And we do that with names all the time. Our names are series of characters kept in an array, and we said that array, we follow a certain standard. We add a zero at the end of data, and we call it a C string. So C string is a character array. If I want to hold people's names, I have to see what is the size of the biggest name. I'm going to say 30 characters. So because it's 30 characters, I create an array of 31 characters, one for the null at the end and 30 for the data in it. And I put the information in there. Obviously, not many people have 30 characters in their name, right? So when you have somebody's name is John Lee, then it's going to only hold four for John, one space, and L-E-E. -E, that's going to be uh, four, five, and eight. And nine characters will be used out of 30. And the rest becomes unused. OK? Yes? No. You're, you're stuck with what you have. You can't add a new item. The problem is that by the t you are, that's an amazing question. Okay? Listen to this carefully. When you are writing the program, the user is not there. You cannot know if the data gets bigger. That's why you have to find the maximum number possible and make it even a little bigger so your program works a little longer before they tell you our, our store grew, now we have a thousand items. Then you have to say, I have to give you version two of my program where you want to make this one uh, a thousand. No, because the, uh, it, it's chicken and the egg. You say, I want to create another array. How do you know how big that it's supposed to be? No, the last one is, is happening at runtime. Runtime is when you wrote your program, you compiled, you are gone. And user has the executable, you do not exist anymore. Runtime is when your program is compiled and is running. You are not present anymore. Now, good news is that you're going to learn how to do that in OP244. We call that dynamic memory allocation. It's a, that's why I'm saying uh, you need to know pointers. To, know, to be able to do that, you need to know pointers. That's why I say it's very important to know that. So to be able to dynamically allocate memory based on user's need while the program's running, that's a very high, high professional thing to do. You, you have to wait for it. For now, you, say, you, you ask the client, how big is the name, maximum name that you have ever seen? They say 20. You say, OK, I'm going to put 40, just to make sure everything is OK. I know you're wasting memory, but that's the price we have to pay for lack of knowledge, OK? In C language, we could do dynamic memory allocation too, but it's extremely low level, which means it's very difficult to teach. If this was a fifth semester subject and I was teaching to people who already knew C, C++, and advanced C++, then I would, could teach them in an advanced C course how to do dynamic memory allocation. For us, is too rich for our broad. Is that okay? All right. So now, to be able to easily take care of these things, C language has a search and replace mechanism. Literally. Literally. When I say search and replace, have you ever written a, a, something, a, a, a letter about something, and you refer to the person as a he, and then you find out, oops, it's not a he, it's a she. So you said, search all the he's and change them all to she. You can do that, OK? You can do that in C. How do you do it? Because this program may change later on, I can actually come over here and write define max. And it's customary to put everything capitalized. Max number of products. And I'm going to make it 100 now. OK, no semicolon. It's search and replace. It means you are telling to the compiler, before compiling my code, search for max number of products and replace it with 100. So what you do, any place you want to 
apply that instead of that value, you put that. Okay? So if the client comes back and says, now we have 200, you're going to say, sure. It's, it's going to take a week. You don't tell them it's going to take two seconds. You just got to go up there, make the 100, 200, recompile, and everything's done. And a week later, you're going to give it to them and charge them $500. <laughs> <laughs> Joking, but yeah. Okay. So does it make sense? Okay. That's it. This has nothing to do with C language. Constant belongs to C language. This belongs to the compiler language. Remember, as I told you, writing a C program, you're writing in two languages. Anything that starts with a hashtag, you are talking to the compiler, telling to the compiler what to do before compilation. When you write const yada yada yada, that's C. That's not, that's not compiler. In here, there is no constant schmonts and stuff. When the compiler is actually compiling it, all these things are replaced by 100. It's, let, 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 let me show you this. <clears throat> I'm going to say define mistake A plus B. Okay? And then in here, I'm going to do this mistake. Right? When I compile this, to see if it, oh, I can't even compile it, not here, I'm gonna, because this is not the main file. When you compile this, you're going to see the compiler brings the cursor over here and says, undefined symbol A. And you look at it, it's mistake. It's not A. Why is it saying A? Because compiler changed all the mistakes to A, and A was unrecognizable over here, so it gave you a, an error for A. But it's not A, it's, <laughs> it's the thing you changed. So define statement happens before compilation. It has nothing to do with compilation. Const is a C thing. So you're essentially creating a variable and telling to the compiler, hey, this variable is constant and it's not going to change. For example, if you want to, in old times, so I'm going to remove this and give you an example on, of it later. In old times, we used to do this. We used to say, for example, define pi to something like that. OK, so that's the pi, right? So whenever you want to use the pi number, that's what you do, correct? But then they say, why do that? Uh, for reasons that I'm not going to tell you, it's more efficient to have a constant. They say, instead of that, we're going to create a global variable, call it const double pi equals to, and they do that. So this is not compile time anymore. This is not pre-compile time anymore. This is part of your C language. You just created a variable that is unchangeable. There is something called pi that is recognizable. You can extract its address. You can, it's a variable with a name. The other one, Anything that you define doesn't exist at compile time because it's replaced by the value you, you asked for. Sure. I can say yes, it doesn't take up memory, but I'm lying through my teeth because any number that you, you see this zero that I wrote over here? It occupies an integer. It goes to a place that is called literal pool. Literal pool is a place that compiler puts around any number that you write, it puts it over there and tags it so it can use it. You write zero over here, this zero must exist somewhere, right? Although it's a literal value, but it has to exist. So when, when you write 100, any place that it writes 100, that's still an integer somewhere. It doesn't have a name, it doesn't have an identity. It's not a variable, it's a literal value, but it still occupies space. So should I lie to you and tell you, yeah, it doesn't, uh, or, or go through details and confuse the heck out of everyone? So let's just say it's different. We'll find out later on that uh, constants are more efficient to use, but we are not using it now because even your C compiler might give you an error on it, so don't do it. We need to really learn how to globalize a variable. When you create a variable const like that, 
that const variable like that is only visible to this file. In another file, it's not visible. But the defined statement, you put it in a header file, and any source code that includes that header file, everything gets replaced automatically. So you can reuse your defined statement, okay? Not a good, a good explanation, but let's live with it. So I'm gonna take this thing out for now. So just, so uh, that's a defined statement. So now I have by default 100 products over here. And the good thing is that I don't need to remember what was the maximum number of products. At any moment I wanna say, what was the maximum? I just use this. I know it's a big num name thingy, but with IntelliSense you type it, it tells you. So you use it, and then at any time you want to change the value, you go and change it, two seconds. Okay, so, so for example, in our loops over here, it's, we are saying num, then it's a good idea, it says and i less than max number of products because I don't want my program to crash. And the same thing over here for reading items, I'm gonna say num and i less than max number of products. Okay, so now, uh, my read not only goes up to none, but if they are crazy and there are 100 and they put 300 over here, it only goes up to 100 because that's the size of my array, okay? And you can print an error message or something you want, if you want, okay? So that's what the fine statements are. And that's, uh, for those people who came a little late, that's what we are doing today. We are going through everything that we taught last, last time with more detail in every single thing, okay? And kind of fill in the blanks. Oh, which reminds me, now that we are here, let's pause. Should we pause? Let me finish the review and then we'll, I wanna talk about the, the, the workshop that is up, okay? So, so that's that one. Any questions down to this point? So uh, as you see, these are changed a little with, with, the, with the other ones, so that's why I'm doing it like this. So, uh, and a uh, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, we did a string uh, introduction, and we said what a string is. Uh, so I'm gonna go through that one too, because we're gonna talk about it today. So uh, we said um, a string is a, an array of characters that we go through one by one, and, uh, and uh, well, we get information like that from, uh, uh, we, we store information, uh, 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 text information like that in, a, in what we call a C string. So remember, this is an important interview question. If you want to go for a co-op, if you want to go get hired in some place, this is one of the basic things that they ask to see how well you know C or C++. They're going to tell you, what is a C string? If you tell them it's a variable that holds a name, you're not hired. You have to immediately tell that, it's a character array with a standard of null termination to end the data. Or it's a null terminated array of characters. Okay, so there, there is no such thing as string in C language. We don't have such a thing. String is nothing but following a standard. Okay, which we're gonna do. With this standard, what we did, it sucks. Why? Because this read string that I wrote to write the string, we know that I can write a string, read a string through the argument because it's an array, so it changes the target. We know that. But the problem over here is when I do get care, user cannot backspace to correct the mistakes because backspace is a character itself. It's gonna read the backspace and keep adding it to this. So this was a bad example, it was just a, a, a Start up a thing. For that, we're going to use the, uh, uh, the scanf that we have, and I, sh and I showed you how to do it. We're going to go through it uh, today. And, but print string is fine. Well, I can simply say uh, start from z while this is not null, uh, keep printing the characters, and continue. Okay? And that's printing a string. That's fine. But this is all built in into printf and scanf. If you put percent %s, that's what it does. It prints the string for you, so we don't need that. Which brings us to, uh, I'm gonna go through, today we're gonna actually, there is such a thing called string header file. In string header file, you have series of functions who follow the standard of C strings and help you copy one text into another. 
compare two texts to see which one comes first in dictionary. Uh, concatenate one text after another, like you get somebody's first name and a last name, and you want to concatenate the two, it helps you do stuff like that. It can search through a string and find another one, okay? Things like that, but we're not going to use it. Because uh, one thing that I want to relate to my students is that something that is in a library not necessarily is a complicated thing. It's there only because it's used so much. We're going to write many of the string header file functions over here, and you'll see each one of them is probably two lines of code. We'll go through it and you'll see. So you can use your utils instead of string header file. And as practice, any function that you think you need, write it yourself. That's a beautiful practice to learn arrays because you're dealing with character arrays and to be able to do, to do uh, traversing through the LAs because you have to search through things and uh, end it with null and look for backslash and at the end of that, so things like that, okay? We'll go through it one by one. So that was the beginning of the string that we talked about. Parallel arrays we went through. Then we said instead of parallel arrays, we can actually create structures. What is a structure, we say? A structure is essentially, is this the same thing as the other one? Yes, it is. So I don't need this. Let me delete. I completely need to delete that. That's on you. So this is the one. So we said, instead of creating four arrays or three arrays to keep stuff, what I can do is create a package, and that package becomes a new type. It becomes a new integer. It becomes a new double. It becomes a new uh, float. So when I create a structure and I call it an item, item is some kind of a type for me. I can use it like a single variable. I can create arrays of it. I can do everything, anything I want with it. The only difference is that we call that a compound type. It's a type that is built up of other types. It's a custom type. Let's put it that way. So because I wanted to keep track of the price, the SKU quantity, and now I can actually put an array inside of it. It comes in my package, and that's going to be the name of my product, okay? And, and I can actually do that. I can actually create a package like that. Now, the end, um, yeah. So when I create something like this, instead of passing individual arrays, I can actually pass an array of structures to print items. And because this is an array of struct item, so to create it, you write struct item, open curly bracket, and create whatever you desire. To use it, you say struct item, and you create an, uh, a variable out of it. If you want to create a single variable out of a, a structure, you do it as follows. You create a single structure, and I call it to read because, because now it's a single element, it's a single type, I can return it. So I'm returning the whole item through my function, and because that item holds five things in it, 50 things in it, doesn't matter, it returns them all at once. It's one package. As I mentioned, when I get a laptop, a laptop comes with a string screen and the keyboard and the touchpad, and the CPU, and the RAM. I don't have to say, bring your monitor, keyboard, uh, touchpad, and CPU, and RAM so we can do. We don't do that. I'm just going to say, bring your laptop. And that brings everything with it. It's the same thing over here. When I say, read an item, it means read the price, read the quantity, read the SKU, and read the name, all of it. How to access it, we said to do to say something belongs something to English, you put apostrophe S, Farad's hat, right? In C language, it's dot. So whenever you put dot beside something, it's apostrophe S. So I say over here, struct item to read. That read inside its belly has price, SKU quantity, and name. Now if I want to access the individual, I'm going to say to read dot name. It means that is the name of the array. Okay, when I say to read.sku, that is the name of the integer. So I have to put an ampersand to extract its address and send it to scanf. And because for the first one we didn't do it, 
it's because it's, a, it's an array, and array is automatically an address. We talked about it. It's, it's a pointer, points to the beginning of it. So, so uh, and we, we mentioned over here that this means read a string up to. So that caret thingy, that caret sign over here means up to and not including. Okay, so if you say percent square bracket up to and not including backslash n, it means keep reading until you hit backslash n and stop. Okay, keep that in mind. Are we okay with this? If I put over here percent s, that's what we talked about last time, just come reviewing it. If I put percent s, it reads a string, but any white space character becomes its delimiter, which means if you put a name two names with a space in between, it only reads the first one and stops at space. Not to, so, but that gives you many options. So with this, if you, you can get comma-separated values. Okay, you can actually say, read uh, this and that and that and stop at the comma. You can actually do that, up to and not including the comma. Okay, remember, this scanf leaves a backslash n in the keyboard. Okay? as everything else. Like in here, when you are reading, it reads an integer and leaves a backslash in the keyboard. In here, it reads a price. If the user is saying it's not nuts, creating crazy stuff, that will happen. So we assume that user is actually entering something proper. <coughs> are we okay down to this point? So that's that. So uh, we read everything. We create our pack. I did a flush key over here that I didn't need. Um, yeah, I, I, I'll tell you why I did this. Um, if I don't do that, it's not going to work properly. I'll tell you why um, in a second. But uh, so I build everything. Do you remember what flush key was? In utils, we wrote a function to go through characters one by one and dump it. It cleans up the keyboard, makes it ready for the next entry to come. The reason that I did that over here the reason that I did that over here is that the first statement of your read says read up to and not including backslash n. So this is not a regular read anymore. It means when you, if you read an integer and don't clean up the keyboard, the next read that comes will not read anything because the very first thing it hits is a backslash n. So nothing will be read. So I'm cleaning it a uh, keyboard afterwards, OK? Standard readings with scanf. Standard readings with scanf. Standard reading, readings with scanf. Uh, did I destroy anything? No. Standard readings with scanf skips all the leading white spaces. So anything that is standard with scanf skips all the white spaces and leaves a new line at the end in the, uh, in the, th in the memory, which means this. If I have any type of variable, so let's say I have over here character str 51 for a, a C string of 50 characters, okay? And, okay? And then I have integer A, and I have float B, okay? So if I say scanf percent S, and right over here, str, we don't need ampersand because str is already an address. It's an array. If the user enters this, use, let's say this is the data entry, user puts space, 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 goes to new line, puts a tab, and goes to next page, and in here says hello. That percent s, because it's a standard entry, skips all the white spaces until it hits to something that it can read. So it will actually read hello and put it in the SDR. 
Remember, white space characters, leading white space characters are always ignored with standard reading, which means, so, so essentially, let's put it, I'm not gonna exaggerate it that much. So if user enters over here, hello, str will be hello. And of course, a zero at the end. A zero at the end, because it's null terminated, right? And if I say over here, scanf percent D an address of A, and the user enters one, two, three, A, B, C, and hits enter over here. Oh, okay, hits enter over there. If that thing happens, one, two, three will go to A, so A will be one, two, three, because all the leading spaces will be gone, and in the keyboard, we're gonna have, so in the keyboard buffer, we are going to have A, B, C, and backslash, and waiting for the next entry to come. So remember, leading spaces are ignored, okay? And the same thing for a float. If I do the exact same thing for a float, that's what happens. So remember, if it's standard, but if in here I write percent not backslash n, if I do that, now if somebody enters this, hello, and hits enter, if they do that, SDR will hold hello and null at the end. Because now I took over. It's not standard anymore. I am telling to the compiler, hey, I want everything to be read until new line, until you hit new line. So it's going to keep going. Even the spaces will be read. That is why if you leave a backslash n and don't clean up your keyboard so the data becomes like this, backslash n, hello, white space characters will not be skipped anymore because it's backslash n. So your string will be this, an empty string. Because it hits the backslash n, it means nothing. It just makes it an empty string. It's going to be a, a character array with the first element being 0 because it's empty. Got it? OK, so this is buffered entry that we're going to work on today for foolproof entry, for foolproof data entry. So, so that's that. Now that we know this, we've talked about this, and, and structures work the exact same way. So when I create an array of structures like that, because it's an array of structures, I can edit the target easily. So when I, uh, so when I actually write past the, the array, the array represents a structure array that is out there. So when I do read item and one by one I set it to the values, it actually sets the structure array outside. And when I want to print it, like a regular array, I make it a constant to remind myself I'm not supposed to change this. These are supposed to be only printed. And therefore, my main program becomes something very simple and small. I'm saying I have 100 items. Oh, 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 oh. Let's change that. I'm going to bring the other one. Uh, where did I put the other one? Is it up here? No. I want to use the exact same thing. I think it was in parallel arrays. Yeah, so I'm going to bring that over here. So now I can say, and in, in here I can have another define, max name length. And I'm going to put over here, what do I put? Uh, 30, OK? And in here what I'm going to write, I'm going to write, max name length plus one, right? So if they say the name is long, not long enough, I'm not going to worry. I'm just going to go change one thing over there and everything's going to be done. And max number of products, I'm going to copy it and paste it over here. And there you go. So now I have everything set. So um, that's that.
Yeah, so my, my program becomes something very simple and straightforward. I simply say uh, I have this many items in a system, set them all to null. Because I put just one zero over there, all the structures, everything inside the structure, that all becomes zero. Very easy way of doing it. And then I say read two items, print two items, and I'm done. Are we okay with this? Now, let's talk about the workshop that you have three days to do, okay? Because you already have the solution for it. All you need to do is to look at what I've done for the parallel arrays and apply the exact same thing to the uh, project. The difference is that what you need to do now is to actually separate these things into modules. I put it in one thing. So you have to have the functions in a file called report.c and have the, just copy the name of the functions, put it in a report.h so it's organized. Otherwise, it's exactly the same thing. And it's all explained in the workshop that I'm going to bring it up right now. Doing the wrong thing. And the week six you see over there, it means it's based on material in week six in weekly schedule. So that's why it says week six in front of it. Okay? So, so this is the workshop. Okay? So I'm, sa I'm saying in this we're going to... Uh, uh, we're going to learn how to do pass arrays to functions, access array elements, modify contents of an array in a function, use const to pass read only array to a function, the things we have done right now, and use parallels to handle records. In here, uh, uh, the, and this is just uh, submitted with one thing, 144W4P1. So we, there is no P2 for it, for workshop 4, and of workshop 5, and so on and so forth. You have just one reflection that you have to add to it. That's it. Okay, so what I'm asking you over here is to create a report module, and in the report module, uh, you are imp to implement two functions uh, f uh, in a file called report.c and add their prototypes to a header file report.h. Okay, uh, functions will receive the following student mark information and then print. So essentially, you you have a parallel two parallel arrays. That's it. Okay, uh, a parallel array of two. Let's put it that way. Um, one of them is uh, the student number, and the other one is a, so one of them is an integer that gets a six-digit student number, and the other one is a float number that gets a mark. Okay, so what you do, uh, uh, the utils module is provided, so I'm telling you you can use the utils module to do get int and stuff instead of scanf to learn to use code. So it is already in the in the thing to use. You write read student information. Pass student number, float, exactly the same thing that you have done over there. Read them one by one, set them. Uh, I didn't mention what is the maximum number over here because my main is using it, so you don't need to have it. And so, and I'm going to say enter it like this. So you're going to say int, uh, enter student information number, yada, yada. So that's, that's how it actually is going to uh, show. Uh, one by one, it's going to receive it, put a row number over there, and I'm going to say over here, uh, uh, this is how the entry looks like, this is what the user enters, and this is what the user is. So the above example assumes 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and 5, 5, 6 are entered by user, and the two uh, question marks are they replace with the data entry number. So the first one, second one, third, exactly like that. And what print report does, is this, so it receives the exact same thing but in constant version and receives a number that it prints and it's gonna print it like this. So organize it nicely, left justified, we talked about it, you know how to do it, right justified in five spaces with one, uh, five or six I think, six? I don't know, but, uh, whatever. With one thing, add them all up, divide it to the numbers and show the average at the end. Okay, so it's the exact same thing. Really, if you read the note and go on this one, it's going to take you a half an hour to 45 minutes to do it, okay? So get on it immediately and do it as soon as possible, okay? And the main tester program, obviously, that's what it is. That's the main tester program.
So I have 100 student, note, student uh, 100 marks, and I'm going to say print into the number of uh, student records. And I'm using the get ints in utils, and I get the number, and I pass the number, so it gets that one. And in the tester program, I'm telling you, I think, to do two or something. I don't know. It's there. So my tester program is different. Uh, my tester program doesn't have this one. Instead, uh, it just calls it with two or three, and it shows you what data entry you should do so you can quickly copy and paste it so you don't have to type it. And you know how to copy and paste on Linux, right? Just double-click on it and right-click. That's copying, okay? When you are on Linux, just double-click on the data that you want to enter, right-click and paste it wherever the cursor is, and hit Enter, so you don't have to hit the Enter. Some people, yeah, uh, have problems entering it, so that's that. So that's it. So that's uh, the thing. I haven't uh, set up the uh, configuration files for submission yet. Um, I, I'll do it. So the next thing is going to be the exact same thing in a structure with a student name. Okay? So again, you're going to do the exact same thing that I have done in class, but you're going to change the structure to a student, which we're going to talk about now. Questions down to this point? Okay. So how do we modularize? So now, the program that we have in here, the program that we have in here, it has all the stuff in one file, right? How do we make it a module? So that item is my module, right? So I need to have two files over here. So add, uh, not like that, sorry. I'm going to add over here a new item. Um, it's going to be a header file and I'm going to call it item.h, okay? Now, it says pragma once over there, deleted immediately. That is not a C thing. It's C++ middle. Okay? So in here, again, you say, if not defined, then you use the name. So it's going to be Seneca, underline item, underline h, and then you copy that. Do not retype it. Copy it and change this to defined. Okay, that guarantees that this header file will get compiled only once, even if it's included 50 times. Okay, now in here, you will, the very first thing that you will bring is the structure definition and the defined statement. So you bring those two things in and you put it in item.h. So anybody who wants to deal with an item knows what the restrictions of the values are and at the same time, it knows what, it, they know what, is, what a, an item structure is. This is defined in every single file that the item.h is included, okay? So that's number one. Obviously in here now I'm going to include, see as soon as I include over here item.h, then the error is going to go away because now it knows what's going on. Then I'm going to create an item.cpp. Oh, sorry, item.c, my apologies. Item.c. And in item.c, I'm going to put the uh, the implementation of the functions. So these functions that are all item-related, they're all going to go to item.h. The implementation of all those is going to go to item.c. Obviously, in item.c, you have to include item.h. Otherwise, it doesn't know what the heck is a structure of item, right? So in here, you have to say include item.h. So now, take a look at my code. Much cleaner, right? Now I have, I'm going to say, this is what I have, this is my item. I don't even need to include, I don't need to include anything in here other than item. Oh, yeah, other than item. I'm not using standard input-output. I'm not using anything other than reading and printing items, right? So when I run this program, because it's, because every, and now I have to come actually into items, something I forgot. In items in here, I have to include 
standard input output dot h, actually all the things that I removed from here. <coughs> These have to come over here because they're all used in here. And in item dot h, am I using anything? No. So that's good. You never, ever remember this from now till the day you die. OK. You never include a header file inside another header file unless you have to. OK. Which means you look at this. Do I have anything in here that needs a header file? No, so you don't do it. Because including a header file inside a header file forces other people to include things they don't want. As you see, I just wanted the item. I included this. If you had the standard input output included here, I would have included that one into my main. But I didn't need it, right? So don't do that. This is hidden logic. Use, include the header files where they are used, not just randomly, just in case scenarios. Never do that, OK? Nowadays, you don't notice because our computers are ginormous with respect to memory, OK? Thankfully, I'm a dinosaur. I come from a time that I wrote a program and the compiler couldn't compile because it had too many lines, because I kept including files. When you include a file, what happens? It's a copy and paste. It literally copies the contents of another file into the file before compilation. If you include 50 header files, 50 header files code will be included. So I remember that I actually comp compiled and it says out of memory. I could, it couldn't compile. Old time XT computers, you don't know what they are, but very, very, very old computers. What is the speed of your computer? What is this? Who knows what is the speed of the computer? 3.6 gigahertz. I wrote program on a computer with one megahertz speed. One megahertz. One gigahertz is 1,000 megahertz. <laughs> okay. So, so <laughs> appreciate your, I love computer science. You feel like you've, you've lived through eras of time. Okay. Anyway, so that's that. So now we have this. Uh, so this is how you modularize it. So the next one that's going to come, you're going to do it like this for your structure. Okay, which means you're going to create a report uh, function, uh, report module. In your report module, you're going to have uh, in your report.c, you're going to have the, the student structure created, and student structure will have name, mark, and student number. And you're going to do the exact same thing that you've done over here, but with a student. But please do not copy and paste. Read this, understand it, set it aside, do your own. If you hit any walls, set yours aside, read this again without looking at yours. Then go back, look at your, your own, see if you can find the error. If you did this five times and you still couldn't, then you put it side by side. And that becomes the aha moment. So you looked at it five times and you didn't find out, then you put it side by, ah, that's why. And that goes to your long-term memory, I guarantee it. And you're never going to make that mistake again. Many students ask me, how do I study programming? This is how you do it, OK? You write code without looking at any other code. And then you set yours code, your code aside, then look at your reference, OK? Do not ever put the two things unless you have tried five times. That's my golden thing, OK, golden number. OK, so we are good down to this point. Any questions? OK, all right. Uh, do you guys need a break, or we can end early? Anybody needs a break? OK, it's early in the morning. Usually, early in the morning, you're all fresh, right? Salut. Mm. This is water. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so that's that. So that's the thing we created. Now, about uh, uh, we went through structures and all, arrays and all the good stuff. We know all those things. Now let's go to foolproof entry and see how we can actually do foolproof entry, data entry. We're going to go back to our utils. So the flush key is good. 
the flush key is good, but I'm writing too many things over here. I have a character CH. I am reading the CH. Then I'm checking to see if CH is not equal to backslash n, and I go back through it, right? Doesn't get care return a character that it's read? Why do I need to keep it in a CH? Why don't I just do this? Done. It's the same thing, right? It's a while loop. It says while character is not backslash n, keep doing it. When it hits the backslash n, it stops. Right? You can all, when you learn something, then make it better. Never try to, as a rookie, never try to program like this first shot. First, create 50 variables, create it. Then put the code, go back and take a look, see what you can eliminate. Okay? So, <clears throat> I am scan, so this is good. I'm scanning a number, right? And I am flushing right after, correct? Which is good. But how do I know if they actually entered the correct integer over there, the correct value for an integer? How can I know that? Very simple, actually. You know how you do it? You check the return value of scanf. Scanf returns the number of successful reads. So if you have 3% signs inside scanf, which means you are reading three things, if scanf returns three, it means I read three things. If it returns two, it means the first two were successful, the third one was not. If it returns one, it means the first one was successful, the rest were not. If it returns zero, it means none of them were successful. If it returns minus one, it means it couldn't even read. It couldn't read for like your console was not open to be read, to be read. something that doesn't usually happen with console. Well, I'm going to show you why, why, why we do that exactly. So, so these are the things. So now I can actually check the scanf. I can say over here, <coughs> while scanf is not equal to 1, right? What does that mean? It means it wasn't successful, right? First flush the key, then printf, bad integer. Try again. Right? So it's going to try to read. If scanf says can't read, it's not a good integer. Can't do it. It comes in here, first of all, because it can't read, it's garbage in keyboard. Wipes out the garbage, prints, hey, what the heck you're doing? Do it again, goes back up and reads again. Until the user comes to their senses and actually enters something properly. Now, if you recall, we said if you enter values that scanf can read and put garbage after, it's still successful, OK? Because of that, we have to do a flush after anyway. Because if it's perfectly good, I have one new line in the keyboard. If it sucks, I have many garbage and new line. So I, I still flush anyway. <clears throat> and that becomes a get int, a foolproof get int. Let's take a look at it. Actually, let me do everything in here. I have a double two, right? Because potatoes, potatoes, they're all the same. So in here, I'm going to say while this is not equal to 1, for any case, if it's wrong, flush the key, printf, bad, real number, try again. Go to new line and a prompt, and flush key after. What else do we have? Yeah, that's it. So let's go back to our program in here and modify, uh, I don't need that, modify our, our item. So in item, where am I reading? Read items, uh, so read item, read item. So in read item, I'm doing scanf. 
So instead of doing, a, oh, this we haven't written anything for yet. Well, let's do that before we do anything. So for strings, there is no way to validate. Validating a string is difficult. OK? You have to go through logic and see what is the same name to put over there. If somebody puts 952, and <laughs> 952 is still valid string, right? So for that, we're not going to validate. We're just going to get it. And to get the string, <clears throat> I'm going to use the exact same thing in, ha in here. And mm, uh, where is it? Uh, I'll go to uh, utils.c. I'm going to create a function. And I'm going to call it void. I'm going to call it get line. Why I call it get line? Because it ends to a backslash n, right? So it reads everything down to a back. It's essentially one line. So I'm going to call it get line. That, that's what it means. So I'm going to call it get line. Line. And I'm going to put over here character string. Right? I'm going to use the exact same thing for that one with the scanf thingy that I had in here. Right? So I'm going to say over here, scanf up to backslash n and put it in the SDR and then flush key afterwards to make sure there is nothing left in the keyboard. Are we okay with this? So it's a clean little thing that I wrote and I call it get line so I don't have to do that over and over. <coughs> Obviously, I have to add this. Should I make this const? No, because I'm writing in it. <laughs> if I do it read only, it kind of defies the purpose, right? So now I'm going to come back to my utils.h and add the get line. So I'm going to go void get line character str. And obviously, to be a good person, I'll, I'll do something like this. And I'm going to write uh, reads, uh, reads a C string from console up to new line up to new line character, new line character and then flushes the keyboard buffer. OK? So writing something like this, why is it giving me wiggly thingy? Not found? Really? Um, maybe you should save it. Did I miss it? This is get it is that C, right? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for being observative. Thank you. I this is called camel notation. And I so so what I'm saying is that now I can actually, instead of doing this, this instead of this scanf, I can actually say get line. And in here, as you see, when I do this, it explains to me what it is. Reads a C string from console up to new line character and then flushes the keyboard buffer. So writing those three slashes before every single thing is a lifesaver, especially when three years later you are using your utils file. OK? You are supposed to reuse your code. That helps you what's going on. And str is to read. So that's the one that is going to get read. Or will be set to console thing. You're gonna write the proper thing in front of it. But anyways, I'm gonna write over here. Uh, I'm gonna write to read dot name. So that's the name it's gonna read. That's gonna read it. And in here, <clears throat> I'm I'm reading an integer. So in here, I'm gonna say get int. Get int. And this one is uh, a double. It's going to be another, it's going to be get double. And this one is going to be uh, an integer. I'm going to call it get int. OK. Now, if I run the program <clears throat> three years later, when it runs, enter the name. Uh, this is it. It's item, right? So I don't know, shampoo. OK. 
Now, SKU, I'll put this. Bad entry. Try again. Okay? So now I'm going to say, oh, sorry, it said SKU. It's not a thing, so I'm going to put one, two, three, uh, four, five. Now it accepts it. For price, I'm going to say very expensive and bad, no, bad, bad real number. Put a real number over there. Now I can actually enter $12.33. Quantity, again, because I'm reusing the code, it will never let me get away with bad information. Obviously, for quantity, I can say uh, 1, 2, uh, 12 uh, is the number. But it doesn't matter. It's going to flush it anyway for the next one. And the reason that it stopped over here is that I have a flush key over here for no reason. <laughs> I had that flush key because I was using Scanf. I don't need a flush key anymore. Each one of them is doing the flush of their own, so it, it was not needed. <clears throat> That's why it paused over there. Okay? Now it's going to be okay. So now when I enter it, I can actually put over here. And for SKU, I can put one, two, three, four, five is the SKU. It's just going to read that one. The rest goes to garbage. Okay? Later on, you'll see we can actually detect that too. There's a trick. We can actually do something to make sure they only enter something that is valid. Very simple to do, OK? <clears throat> As a challenge, try to do it. See if you can. It's very simple. It takes two seconds. Um, um, yeah, yeah, so anyways. So price, anyways, $12.33. Quantity is one, two, three. And it goes like that, and you can continue. So now I have a foolproof entry, and user cannot enter garbage for me anymore. At least I have some information that is valid when it comes in. My program is not going to crash. Are we okay down to this point? Yes. That is regular expression. <laughs> I didn't say it because it's not. Okay. That is regular expression. Okay. Regular expressions are written in C. <laughs> Anyways, so. Linux is written in C. So, kind of a chicken and the egg type of a thing. Right? Are we okay down to this point? Are we okay? So, that's, uh, uh, so actually, let's do it. Um, so, you know what? For now, I'm just going to, I'm just going to commit it as is. So, let's do it. See, this is, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, Come in uh, here. I'm going to right click. I'm going to go sync. And in here, I'm going to say uh, commit. I'm going to say uh, full proof uh, step one. And let's add everything, actually. I'll add everything that I have in here. Commit and push. So at this stage, so when you look at the diff, this is where I did full proof, but it's not complete full proof. Okay? Now I'm going to do the second full proof where I said, because uh, I see we have time, I can actually do that. So I'm just going to come in the item over here for, uh, in this utils.c. Um, now, think about it. How can I guarantee that after this integer that I have over here, after this one, nothing but backslash n is entered. How can I guarantee that? How can I make sure? Well, how do I know if, if after percent e something is entered that is valid or not? All I need to do is to read one more character. If that one more character is new line, it means done. They didn't enter any garbage. If it's anything other than new line, it means they entered something extra they, where they weren't supposed to. So scanf reads all the possible things that it's reading. Then it stops at something, right? I want to make sure that something is the enter key, which means they didn't add anything else. <coughs> all I need to do is this. Character new line and put it some garbage in it. So space. So it's not that one, right? 
So I'm going to say in here percent C. So I'll read one more thing, and I put that one in the new line. Okay? So if it is not equal to, not one, because now it's two of them. If it's not equal to two, which means it, wasn't, it didn't read the, both the two things successfully, um, <clears throat> or new line is not new line, then flush the key, right? And say bad integer, try again. And because I am re, if this thing goes successful, it means it read two things, and the new line was actually new line, which means I don't need to flush anymore. Because that one new line is read. That flush was just in case if it's successful or if it's garbage. So I don't need that. So if, so let's try it, see if it, see if it works, okay? I'm just going to do it for this. Quite frankly, seriously, I don't know if it, I just write it off, but I don't memorize things. So let's bring this down so it, it's kind of, so I'm saying read if it's not to, or if it's not equal to new line, then flush the key and yada, yada, yada. Okay, I think it's going to be okay. So let's run it. So item name is was shampoo for some reason. I don't know. And SKU. So this will be bad integer. We know that. Now I'm going to say one, two, three. And I hit enter. Still says bad integer. If I say one, two, three, one, two, three, still bad integer. If I say only one, two, three, and hit enter, now we're good. You see? So you can even test that one so easily. All these things can be done with simple piece of code added that follows the logic of buffered entry. Remember, characters that are coming through keyboards are people standing and lined up in Tim Hortons to get coffee. Okay? You serve the first three people, the rest of them will be still in line. They're not going to evaporate. You have to always remember that. And you always end your data entry on co console by hitting the enter key. That's the magical thing. If you get to backslash in, you're good. All right? So we can add the, log the exact same logic to the other one. So there is no uh, uh, problem with that. I'm just going to copy this over here. It's going to be the same thing with the double. And in here, if it's, I'm going to say if it's not equal to 2. Or new line is not, I didn't put the other one, I'm going to put it, is not equal to So what am I doing in here? Okay, I'm going to say percent %c, so read an integer after that, uh, a character after that, and put it in new line. And remove the flush because we don't need to flush anymore. <clears throat> okay? So for get line, I can't do anything. That's, that's how it is. It, uh, it always ends a thing and it flushes. So we're good with that. All right. So let's just compile and run it, make sure it works before I commit it. Item name, whatever. Uh, SKU, I'm going to put one, two, three in a space. Good, bad. So one, two, three. Now it's fine. Price, I want to put one, two, three, A, B, C. Bad number, 1, 2, 3, uh, point two three ABC, bad number, 1, 2, 3, good number, because 1, 2, 3 is a double. Although it's an integer, it's 1.0. So it works. So I get out. Now this is what I'm going to do. And I want you to take a look at this and learn it. So now I'm going to commit. I'm going to say full, foolproof get int and, and get double. And I'm going to commit and push. So what you do, you go on the repository, and you see over here is a foolproof yada, yada, yada. If you click over here, and you can go uh, split, and it shows exactly what it was and what it became. 
So you can exactly see what I changed to make it a full, full, full proof. Got it? Use this diff for your own work too. It helps a lot. Okay? So now I can see this was the one that I had. This is the one that I made. And now it's working that way. Are we okay with this? Every single commit that I do has that thing. So you can click on it and see what happened for in, this comp, in this submission. That's that. OK, so let's go to uh, the, the page. Uh, the, um, just want to make sure that. So the next day you are coming, I want you to get your coffee, be alert, be rested the night before, uh, because I want to teach pointers. And I ask you, please, not to go and study it yourself. OK, come with a fresh brain. I want fresh brains to teach. I don't want to replace misunderstanding. That's difficult, OK? After I'm done, go study and come with questions, OK? So weekly schedule. So pointers, fantastic, OK? So. Just, just to tell you that we are not that behind, because unlike other sections I started with functions, these things are already done. You already know how functions and structures and everything work. So we are quite ahead. And the string thingy, we're going to go through it right now. So string header file is going to get clear for you too. Not only clear, but also you know how it works. So. Again, it's going to be an introduction. I'm not going to go through it uh, in total, but I'm just going to tell you how things are going to happen. So this prg.cpp, I'm going to save it as uh, e-item main.c. Okay? So we can actually do things over here now. Now, <clears throat> how do I copy? names and strings and stuff like that. In my opinion, the best way of doing it is to design it in a structure. If you design it in a structure, you don't need to worry about copying because structure is one thing, right? If I want to hold someone's name, if I want to hold someone's name, if I have something like character name uh, 41, OK, and I have character another, 41, we know that I cannot do, and let's say this is by default fardat. We know that I cannot say another is equal to name. Can't do it because these are arrays. It's not a single entity. I don't have one thing. Assignment only works for one entity. How can I convert that name to one entity? It's very simple. Instead of doing something like this, you can actually say struct name, and in here, call it character first, even make it two things. First, say 21, and character last, 31. OK, first name, last name, right? And now, in here, I can, I can do something like this. I can say uh, struct, not that struct, struct name, um, name, lowercase, equals to fardat soleimanlu struct, or I can just create another one over here. Comma in here, I'm going to put another. Now doing something like this, I can say another is set to name. That's perfectly OK. Because they are single entities. I just made them. It's a one type. It's like double, like int. It copies the entire thing from name into another. There is no array in here. There are two custom types. It's as if I'm saying, I want the hard drive of this laptop to be cloned on that laptop. 
and they become the same thing. You know what I mean? Everything from here will go to that one, and they become the same thing. So all entities will get copied. That's the structure way of doing it. So if you have two structures with arrays in it, you want to set one to another. Don't, grow don't go through copying every individual things one by one. Remember that structures are one complex entity, but still they are one entity. Because of that, assignment works for them. Are we okay? But how can I say over here, how can I actually copy into name last Soleil instead? Overwrite it. I can't do it. This is wrong. You can't do this. I, I know that it doesn't give you an error, but you, do, you can't do this. This doesn't happen. You can't, it, this, uh, this doesn't work, okay? Because this is, not an, this is an array. And what you're writing over here, as you mentioned, although I wrote it over here, it's somewhere in memory. It creates a nameless array somewhere to be used. It's still a series of characters somewhere. For this, I have to copy individual characters one by one from here over here and null terminate it. And to do that, I have to write a function. So I'm going to go to my utils, and I'm going to write series of string handling functions. So the very first thing, string copy. I want to copy one string to another. Void str copy. The left one is the destination. I want to copy over. So I'm going to say character destination. The right one I want to copy from. That's constant. We already know it. Source character. How do I copy it? Very simple. Because it's supposed to be a string, it's null terminated. If somebody don't, pa don't pass a string in here, it's their fault. It's going to crash. It's their fault. Let it crash. But if it's actually a string, I'm sure that source is null terminated. So I'm going to write over here integer i set to 0. Then I'm going to say 4. Uh, integer i, I don't need to, i to 0. Uh, i set to 0. I, and in here, I'm going to say source i not equal to null and i plus plus. Right? And then I can, I'm going to say destination i is set to source i. So what happens over here? It starts from the beginning one by one, puts source 0, destination 0. Source 1, this keeps going until this becomes null. When it's null, it comes out, right? That null didn't get copied because it was the reason the loop stopped, correct? So I have to make sure now that the destination is null. Done. That's string copy. That's actually inside string copy. So if you include str.h, string.h, str copy, and that one does this. So now I can actually do this. I can actually, in my, where is it? Oh, did I change the main? Darn it. Copy. Don't save. I'm supposed to change this one. So now in here, I'm going to have, uh, so, uh, so now I'm going to have something like this. Uh, uh, include utils. Dot h. And uh, obviously, I'm going to add that uh, prototype to my header file. Obviously, you're going to have to put something over there to explain what it is. And then I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to say uh, str copy into another uh, name or uh, name dot first fred str copy into 
name dot last select. So now when I have over here something called uh, print name and in here struct name n and in here I'm going to say printf percent s space percent s and I'm going to put over here n dot first n dot last to print the name all right so now in here I can say print name a name and put care new line okay and I'm gonna do the exact same thing with another to just to show you that another is in fact set <clears throat> okay so when I run this program three years later I'll get Fred Soleil for the first one and Farad Soleil Mando for the second one so it simply copies everything and I get 50 things over here saying uh, yes this null thing is Uh, ignore that warning. This is C, but the compiler is C++. It's giving you an error, okay? But in C compiler, you don't get this error. No professional programmer does this, not equal to null. If, if you give this code to anybody, say it's my code, they'll say this guy doesn't know what is true or false in C language. Because you don't need to write not equal to null. We know that null is false. Zero is false. Anything but zero is true. You, so you can just put over here. So instead of doing this, instead of doing this, you can do this. It's the same. And in here, you, can, you don't need to say null. Just say zero. It's the same. It's zero. Zero, null, potatoes, potatoes. It's just zero, right? Zero is zero. When everything is zero, what's the difference? So that's that. So doing this, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping that thing. So it's going to keep going until this is not null. And then, uh, so let's see if it's going to give me a, a trouble again. Compile, compile, compile. Yeah, it's fine. So. Now, as practice, before we come the next day, I'm going to end the class. They just demonstrated to you how strings, C strings, are being copied and passed around. We cannot compare two strings with less than and greater than. You have to have a function called string compare. String compare is supposed to be written like this. I'll write the in a header file, and this is how it is. Int str compare const character left and const character right. So these are the two, okay? So this is how it's supposed to be, and this is how it's going to work. Returns, so I'm, I'm gonna say left less than, oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Less than, I think I have to write it like this. Left less than right uh, uh, returns negative value left equal to right returns zero left greater than right returns positive value so you have to write the function like this so left is left string uh, string to compare And the same thing over there. So, so having these, oh, well, anyways, I should have put this one down here, put it up there. But anyway, it should be in returns. So in here, it should be compares two strings and shoot. <clears throat> ah, later. Okay. So, C summary. I'm gonna say C summary. <laughs> Okay, so now, um, yeah, so you have to write that. And it's very simple. It's the exact same size as strip copy. You have to think of it how, okay? So we'll talk about it later, and that's going to be the next day.
Thank you very much. As promised, 10 minutes early. Uh, please do the workshop. Three days to do it. Then every day that you're late, you're going to lose 10% up to five days. So if you do four days, it's 90%. If you do uh, five days, it's 80%. And it keeps going down to 50, and then after that, it's zero. Okay? And I'm going to post the structure one, too. That's going to be uh, starting three after the three days of the other one. So when the three days of the first uh, workshop four is done, the three days of workshop five begins. Okay? All right. Please, next time you're coming, be alert, coffee, rested to study pointers. Okay? <laughs>